Welcome to today's video where I'm going to be sharing with you my personal experiences with the Celestron Travelscope 70, specifically what I have been able to see with it. So if you're considering this telescope, perhaps you've recently got one, then these are some of my favourite things to observe in the night sky. Um, I've discovered its strengths and its limitations as well. I'm going to be giving you some tips and recommendations for getting the most out of this telescope as well. So be sure to watch to the end. Now, if you're new to the channel, I su su suggest subscribing uh, and do be sure to hit the like button at any time. And if you've got any questions, comments or feedback on this particular telescope or you're looking for more of my opinion, then drop them down below and I'll get back to you. So general th thoughts, a kind of high level overview. Celestron market this telescope as being ideal for both terrestrial and astronomical observation. And to be honest, I couldn't agree more with that statement. This is a telescope that is great for both of those use cases. However, just a little bit of a caveat, there are much more powerful telescopes out there. Now, chances are you already know that already, but if you're looking for a combi telescope, then this one is very, very good for that. And being a travel scope, it's very versatile, quick setup, as well, so just consider that. So the diagonal itself uses a correct image prism, and that allows you to see the image as you would with your naked eyes. So that's very, very important to consider. The view is actually quite good. Just don't, as I've kind of previously mentioned, expect your views to rival the kind of fine or more expensive refractor telescopes. In terms of the eyepieces, I'm gonna get them out of my pocket now. There's two that come with the telescope. There is a 10 millimeter, as you can see on the right hand side, and a 20 millimeter as well. Now, these aren't the finest in quality, but they are usable and they will give you a good view of objects in the night sky. Now, the 20 millimeter gives a more expansive view and is my preferred eyepiece of the two. The 10 millimeter gives a slightly wavy image that is a bit on the dim side. It's okay, but I really prefer the 20 millimeter eyepiece, so I suggest that if you're getting the telescope that you spend most of your time using this one. So, what have I been able to see? The first thing, number one, and perhaps the best thing to look at is the moon. That probably comes as no surprise. It is undoubtedly my favorite to observe. Now, this telescope handles lunar observation quite well with both of the eyepieces. The resulting views are fairly sharp and detailed, offering a good look at the moon's surface. There's a bit of false color, but it's not enough to detract from the overall experience of observing the moon. The second thing I like to observe with this telescope is Venus, and it appears much clearer when the light is reduced. Otherwise, you will, perhaps will see Venus bordered by green and purple fringes, just bear that in mind. Using the 10 millimeter eyepiece, Venus resembles a small luminous crescent. So number three and four is Saturn and Jupiter. Now these, you can get some great views of Saturn and Jupiter, uh, particularly through the 20 millimeter eyepiece. Through this eyepiece, Saturn appears as a tiny disk intersected by a line representing its rings. Switching to the 10 mm eyepiece for higher magnification enhances the view significantly. Jupiter is impressive with either eyepiece, revealing its four large moons. You can actually see them uh, relatively clearly, but they are still quite distant. With the 10 mm eyepiece, you might even catch a glimpse of some of Jupiter's bands as well. Now, a couple of limitations uh, and recommendations here. I would actually recommend that you invest in decent fossil eyepieces and a Barlow lens. One important caveat is that I found going beyond 80 times magnification didn't yield better viewing results, so just bear that in mind. Consider that this is a cost-effective telescope and these eyepieces, if you're not looking to invest in a higher quality scope long term, it may not be worth it, so just bear that in mind. Now, number five, I love observing galaxies. So I'm in the Northern Hemisphere, you might tell by my accent, I'm in the UK, and the Milky Way is front and center to the south each night. Sorry about the wind, everyone. Hopefully you can still hear. Point that, point the 70 millimeter scope at the Milky Way, and you can just cruise from top to bottom, and you'll see tons of clusters, uh, which I'm gonna discuss more shortly. You'll see various nebula uh, once your eyes are dark adapted. So, number six, open star clusters. This telescope excels when it comes to open star clusters. With the 20 millimeter eyepiece, 
uh, you get a wide, luminous and crisp view of the starry sky, as I've kind of previously mentioned. So for example, I've, obs I've observed NGC 6231, which appeared as a radiant cluster resembling a scattering of diamonds, along with other clusters such as M7 and M6. These clusters, although more spread out, were still clearly visible. However, the 10mm eyepiece fell short in this regard, offering a dimmer and less uh, impressive view, probably not to be uh, expected. When it comes to global, uh, globular clusters and galaxies, this telescope does find it challenging. Bear that in mind, that is a limitation. As I've said, you, you're not going to get the best views with this, but you are, you're, it, its price point and its versatility is where the true uh, perks and bonuses of the telescope are. So, I have actually been able to observe the double clusters in Perseus, M13 in Hercules, and the Pleiades, all of which you can benefit from the wide field of view of the travel scope itself. Now, number seven are double stars. So, these are another highlight with this telescope, particularly, again, using the 20mm eyepiece. So, the contrasting yellow and blue stars of Alberio were vivid and well-defined, even against a backdrop of light pollution. The famous double-double in Lyra also presented a clear view, though the telescope's magnification limits made it difficult to discern extremely close double stars, so just bear that in mind. Um, so in terms of my recommendations on viewing double stars, um, I would refer to the Starry Night software that you get. Uh, I would load that up on your PC and, and leverage that, uh, just so you know where things are. Or alternatively, uh, you can use online star maps for guidance on where to point your telescope. Now, one other thing I'd just like to mention, I've touched upon this throughout the video, the 10mm eyepiece, unfortunately, provides a less satisfying experience with the kind of dim and unclear images. So, I, to be honest, I would stick with this for the most part, the 20mm, and consider an upgrade, as I previously mentioned. Now, last but not least, we have number eight. We have birds and wildlife. So, as you can see here, I've got a bird table. And it's been absolutely brilliant to point and shoot at the bird table. I've seen some amazing birds um, at great detail. Uh, as I said, this telescope is great for both astronomical and terrestrial viewing. And I would say that bird watching is, is one of the highlights. So even though this is an astronomy channel and that's my kind of focus and what I love to do, bird watching is something that I've kind of picked up just out of having this telescope. So lastly, what are my recommendations for this telescope? So. I would consider upgrading it if you have the budget, and as I say, you're not gonna upgrade to another telescope shortly. Uh, in terms of optical improvements, you could consider replacing the original 45 degree uh, correct image diagonal with a more effective 90 degree mirror diagonal. You could do that. Uh, you could swap the uh, finder here uh, with a red dot finder. That can, can make a significant difference. Uh, I've mentioned the eyepieces, so you could upgrade to plossal eyepieces. You could also consider a Barlow lens, a two times Barlow lens is recommended, uh, and that's what I see many other astronomers kind of referencing and mentioning as well, particularly on many forums, so i just kind of mention that. And while the tripod is sturdy enough, you could consider going for something more robust if you have a lot of wind, like I've kind of showed you in this video. Um, sometimes having a sturdier tripod, or depending on where you're looking to view, may, may be useful. So ultimately, this is the Celestron 70mm travel scope. I've seen some great things with it, considering its uh, limitations of um, of optical um, specification. Uh, bear in mind, 70 millimeter objective lens, not obviously the, the highest out there. Its magnification isn't the highest out there either. Um, but for its weight, its size, um, and, and its price point, it does give you some great, great views. Um, it's not without its challenges, but it is budget friendly. So you have, you have to consider that. Uh, we, we can't compare this to much more expensive telescopes. It's not meant to rival them. So from, from kind of very vague views of the planets in our solar system, to better views of the moon and kind of wide field of view star clusters, uh, the expanse of the Milky Way, this telescope has opened up uh, viewing for me. It's great for beginners uh, and it's good just to get an idea of how to use a refractive telescope. So I hope my experiences inspire you to explore the night sky with your Travelscope 70. Perhaps you want to get one now off the back of this video. And as I said earlier, any questions, comments, feedback, drop them down below. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel uh, for more astronomical insights and tips.